I'm Agnieszka Niemark, and this is the Boyce Thompson Institute Centennial Oral History Project. It's June 4, 2023. My interviewee today is John Dentis. John joined BTI as a Chief Financial Officer in 1982 and later became the BTI Vice President for Finance and Treasurer. John worked at BTI until his retirement in 2010. We are recording this interview in John's office at the Triad Foundation in Ithaca, New York. John, thank you so much uh, for taking part in this project. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, please remember all these comments are filtered <laughs> through a 77-year-old brain, so you're getting what you deserve. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, John, so you work at BTI for 28 years. Let's start in the early 1980s when you joined the Institute. Tell us a little bit about the situation at BTI after its transition from Yonkers, New York to Ithaca, upstate New York, and about your background, uh, how your story with BTI started. Hmm. So, joining in 1982 means that virtually all of the transition of the project leaders and their staff had taken place. Um, I believe that began in about 1978 as we moved uh, families and um, laboratories, equipment uh, to Ithaca. Uh, it, it is interesting to note that uh, a few of the uh, technicians in the service area never actually moved, but for the best of my recollection, um, probably six years commuted back and forth from Ithaca to Yonkers on the weekends. Uh, I remember one, uh, sci uh, one uh, uh, support staff person, George Bova, who worked in our mechanical area, sticking his head in the office on Friday afternoons uh, on, on his way out the door to say, see ya, John. We didn't get much done this week, but we'll give them hell next week. <laughs> and George and Courtney McLean would head off to Yonkers and uh, reappear on Monday mornings. So the transition I, I often thought should be a, a, a study by um, a, um, a psychology major uh, because it would make um, wonderful and sometimes heartwarming and heart-wrenching stories of moving families to Ithaca. But uh, by the time I got to the Institute, most of the transition had taken place. Um, it recently transitioned, I think, to uh, a new president, Roy Young, from uh, Richard Wellman. And uh, Roy was uh, putting his mark on uh, the Boyce Thompson Institute. And uh, um, I'll tell you more about myself in just a minute, but Roy, um, Roy had several goals and, and was... But uh, first, I think, in primary was moving... Boyce Thompson comfortably into the Cornell community and making us a part of the Cornell community. And through that, he, Roy was a consummate gentleman. He was always in a suit, a tie and a shirt, and soft-spoken and um, making those relationships uh, all the time. And his work, I think, with Dean Palm, um, really solidified um, Boyce Thompson's acceptance on the campus. Um, Roy had several, um, it's okay to transition into a discussion with Roy? Okay. Uh, um, Roy had, as he explained to me, several goals, and I learned this over, um, over our eight years, six years working together. Uh, first and foremost uh, was to, um, working with the board, to bring the management of the institute's endowment, which at that time was around $24 million, under professional management, wrested away from a single board member, uh, which Roy was successful in doing. Uh, we transitioned the endowment to a, a local group in Ithaca who um, set us up extremely well, and um, their track record of earnings for our endowment uh, were absolutely stunning. And um, probably over the 28 years, uh, well, at least over the first 20 years, we returned on our endowment over 10% a year. Uh, consistent with that, Roy's second goal is to reduce the draw 
or the amount of the endowment that we spent. And um, he was used to university accounting where the, uh, the endowment um, uh, would allow a 4 to 5% withdrawal rate. And that was his goal at Boyce Thompson Institute. Now, Roy inherited a uh, rate of withdrawal from the endowment or a spending rate of somewhere upwards of 11, 12, 13 percent, huge, huge draws. And that was completely untenable. If you're spending 12 and 13 percent, and even if you're making 10 percent, the endowment's heading downhill. Roy was successful. And one of the key reasons he was successful was that the move from Yonkers to a completely paid for facility with <laughs> utilities and maintenance paid, a deal you can't refuse, completely re relieved the Institute's finances of having to support the facility, at least initially. And so immediately that draw rate pulled down from the middle to high teens to probably seven, eight, nine percent. Um, and um, gradually, as uh, as we transitioned on into the next president, we we hit our five percent goal, and uh, that was goal two of Roy Roy Young's was to uh, get us um, get us to a sustainable draw rate. When we talk about Roy Young and also local Itakan community, you mentioned to me that Roy Park Senior play an important role in these early years. Uh, as the Institute was establishing itself in, in Ithaca. Could you talk about the friendship between Roy Young? I, I, I would love to, although I, I didn't sit in on any of those dinners, late night dinners. I do know that um, uh, Roy and um, Roy Park Sr. Um, developed a, a close friendship, a close personal friendship. And I think that probably came from uh, either membership at the Rotary Club or association with um, local financial individuals. Um, the names that come to mind are David Cutting, a local uh, automobile dealership owner, Roy Van, Ray Van Hout, um, the president of the Tompkins County Trust Company, and uh, Tony DiGiacomo, and also Dean Palm. Uh, those four individuals, by the way, were instrumental in flying to uh, to Albany on a very snowy winter evening to conv convince uh, Governor Malcolm Wilson of uh, the desirability of keeping Boyce Thompson in New York State, not moving to Oregon, and building a building and, uh, and uh, enticing us to stay, enticing Boyce Thompson to stay. And I think the, the link between Roy Young and Roy Park Sr. developed through those business relationships and those uh, professional relationships. Um, it was fun having Roy Park Sr. on the board. I many stories, I won't <laughs> belabor them here, but uh, he was intense. And um, that was a change, another change that uh, Roy Young was hoping to make was to move um, the board from, I would say, a good old guys network to something more um, uh, business oriented and more um, actually Cornell oriented. Because with our agreement of affiliation with Cornell, the dean and um, I believe it was also the director of the Ag Experiment Station were um, by title on the BTI board. So bringing those two entities closer together and learning what our spaces were. But the, the reason I came to Boyce Thompson was the third area, I believe it was third or fourth area, where um, Roy was convinced, Dr. Young was convinced that we needed a comprehensive management information system. All the, uh, all the accounting was done in large ledgers. Uh, paper reports were issued um, not very regularly. And the scientists, um, really had no um, comprehensive, accurate reporting of where they stood vis-a-vis -vis budget. So Roy um, needed somebody to help with the installation of a management information system and modernize the systems. And um, as a little digression, that's that's where my skill set um, came from. I, I've put in uh, computer data management systems at a local manufacturing firm in Ith Ithaca at Tompkins Cortland Community College. And this was a perfect fit. Um, 
it, it is interesting. Um, uh, the computer system and the accounting software had already been selected when I arrived. And um, lo and behold, it was um, a lot of that coordination took place by individuals, technical individuals in our environmental biology department. Dick Mandel came, comes to mind and, uh, and others. But they had selected a, a Wang computer system, not IBM, and a Danish software uh, uh, program called the Office Manager. And those were a perfect fit for Boyce Thompson, along with a, a very, very skilled um, support group out of, uh, out of Rochester, New York, Buffalo, Rochester, New York. We, um, we put in a new management information system that just knocked socks off the scientists. So that worked really well. And I've mentioned Roy's ties to the community, um, uh, making the scientists comfortable with the community and making uh, Cornell comfortable with BTI. But that's uh, many, many of uh, uh, Roy's accomplishments. He, he, he also began with um, the notion that we needed and the idea that we needed um, a fundraising uh, arm and um, initially hired a young man, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, a, a development officer out of Cornell, Jerry Passer. Jerry stayed with us about a year and transitioned out um, and then hired Ben Williams. Ben, ben matched Roy's personalities perfectly. Gentleman, soft-spoken, deeply connected with the community, very intelligent, and um, uh, they clicked. And, and Ben came in and, and he began establishing those relationships with folks who had donated, with uh, legacy board members, and um, uh, began that fundraising effort. Ben was linked with Roy Park Sr. through uh, Park Outdoor Advertising. And Ben had done a, a tour of duty with Roy Park Sr. and then had moved on to Cornell Development and then joined us from Cornell Development. So another hook. So there was a number of personal and community related connections, right, that helped the institution to, to set up uh, its position in the, in the new environment. Could mm -hmm. you, John, tell us what was your connection to Cornell? I think you mentioned to me that you graduated from Cornell. Uh, so I'm you so knew. sorry. I didn't mention <laughs> tell that. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, coming to BTI, or going to BTI, was like coming home. I was born and raised in Ithaca. Went to Ithaca High School, um, then Cornell University, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. It was uh, Cal's back then. And um, graduated with a uh, bachelor's in agricultural economics in 1968. That was the, uh, essentially the business program on the Cornell campus at the undergraduate level at that time. So ag business. Uh, I took another year and I got my MBA. I earned my MBA from what was then called the uh, School of Business and Public Administration, now the Johnson School. And uh, that was an MBA and my emphasis was, was in production and inventory control. And uh, that led me on to um, uh, working in a s small Ithaca manufacturing firm. And that may seem like a digression, but in many, many ways, it was a perfect setup for Boyce Thompson. Because Boyce Thompson, in accounting terms, is a job shop. We have 30 principal investigators running maybe two or three projects themselves, outside funded and inside funded. So we're running 90 to 100 mini projects. And that's pure job shop accounting with a not-for-profit spin and throw in a layer of government accountability and, and you have Boyce Thompson and you have something that was a lot of fun to work on. So that's my background. Yeah, maybe we could talk a little bit about different uh, sources of funding for BTI mm -hmm. and how this was changing with the next president. If we could transition to Ralph Hardy, who took uh, his position in 1990 uh, and also understand how Ralph was trying to improve the financial situation of BTI. Um, as, I've, as, as I've thought back on the five presidents that I worked with at BTI, um, Ralph probably made the most dramatic changes 
Some would say to the better, some would say to the worse. The most dramatic and long-term impactful changes at Boyce Thompson Institute. And um, he immediately picked up and amplified concerns of Roy Young's that the scientists, the science was not cutting edge. And uh, to be cutting edge, you have to be published, you have to be recognized, you have to be invited to meetings, and you have to be funded, funded by external sources. And the, the key, and Ralph, Ralph Hardy's probably consummate goal, uh, and, and he only articulated this subtly to me, was to redirect the science at Boyce Thompson Institute. And I, I hate to categorize science, but the feeling I got was it was to reduction science and the molecular sciences and away from the applied sciences. And um, uh, Ralph, Ralph's feeling was that um, scientists needed to be applying for funding outside of the institute's largesse, the institute's pocketbook, and that institute funding would come second to uh, external funding. And, um, and so we saw at that time, fortunately, a, a rise in, now we're, we're talking now um, late 80s, early 90s, we're talking about a rise in uh, government funding and all sorts of sources. And Ralph um, not only would emphasize corporate funding, which he had some of his own personal funding, but also from any, any number of agencies, the National Science Foundation, the Department of Agriculture, um, so, on, so on and so forth, um, the Nas National Institutes of Health. Um, there was a broad array of applications going out, and slowly but surely, a broad array of funding that came in, each with its concomitant uh, responsibilities for reporting and so on and so forth. But the scientists um, uh, stepped up. Uh, to allow this to happen, though, um, there's a tough transition that needs, needs to take place, and that's the transition of scientists and programs out, uh, away, um, and essentially um, retirements, of, uh, retirements of individuals that um, Ralph deemed and our various management committees deemed as um, not on, on the cutting edge and not productive. Coming from the corporate environment, uh, from um, DuPont, Ag Chemicals, um, Roy did a, a, a couple of things. And, and one, keeping with the theme of refreshing the board, brought onto our board um, uh, senior officers from uh, various ag chemical companies. Um, Paul Hoffman from Velsicol, uh, Bob Olford from um, um, Allied Biochem Division, I believe it was, and others. And um, consistent with that was the uh, idea of cutting edge science that might have applicable or ap ap applications in the real world. Uh, basic science uh, that, that could be patented, and then licensed to produce a revenue stream. So Ralph created uh, the first notion uh, that intellectual property was important and encouraged scientists. He combed through our research to see if there was anything developable uh, or patentable. Uh, and um, finding very little, <laughs> little, uh, he moved on to encouraging scientists to explore areas uh, maybe a more that had more of an application bent. Now, I per personally felt, and this is a bit of a digression, that that is absolutely opposite the way <laughs> our scientists think. Our scientists love, and I appreciate them for it, basic science. And what the applications are will only come from a long, long course of discovery, maybe coincidence, but I think Ralph felt at the poking and prodding of the applicability, there might develop some intellectual property, consistent with what he had done in his corporate environment and consistent with what he saw as instrumental 
to raising money in um, in large corporations. So um, that, that, that kind of mixes in the corporate side of things, but the creation of a suite of intellectual property. Now, at that time, Ralph ran all that himself. Subsequently, we'll maybe talk about the fact that uh, uh, that was all brought in under uh, an IP, uh, intellectual property function, and Paul Debbie's work um, with, with, with me, but mostly Paul Debbie's work uh, going on into the future. Um, Ralph, so in the midst of this, I'm going to go back and talk a little bit of finances. It it is very difficult to um, transition out senior staff and their and their technicians without creating an incentive, a uh, financial incentive, or at least a hold harmless phase, if you will, of retirement. But again, the institute was blessed. We had and continued to have uh, an overfunded pension plan, and. Because of that, we could create, I'm going to throw some words at you, an enhanced early retirement program for a targeted set of individuals that could retire with benefits equivalent to what they would have received had they continued to their normal retirement age. Now, I, don't, I know that's an oxymoron because there's no normal retirement age for a scientist. Scientist never retires. I don't know if you know that, but they never retire. They just go to the basement and do more science. But we, and this is one of my great prides, is that over the time that I was there, many, many scientists, in fact, most of the original scientists had departed. But we were able, based on this overfunded pension plan, whose assets were continuing to grow in a very robust financial time, to have them leave essentially without a financial consequence to what their retirement would have been had they left. And that could only have happened because way back when the retirement plan was created as the Institute transitioned to Ithaca, something called an unfunded liability was funded. And the board at that time, whether they knew it or not, well, they actually did know it, put tens of millions of dollars into a pension plan to completely fund the plan. The terminology is the plan was never underwater from its inception. It was incredibly well financed, and it, and it really showed the, um, the investment that the then board had in its scientists. It did not want to cause the creation of a new plan to put anybody at a disadvantage. Well, we were able to use that overfunded plan, which remained overfunded or adequately funded throughout this retrenchment period to retire out many scientists, many technical staff, and lots of support staff to receive the pension benefits they would have received. Yeah. Maybe we should just link this retirement plan to the streamlining of the programs that was uh, going on during Ralph Hardy. Yeah, we yeah. try Ralph moved from the programs that were established back in Yonkers into, mm -hmm. I think, just four main areas of research. And this is why some researchers were encouraged, you know, to take the early retirements, right? Because the programs were changing. And the molecular biology program was added at that time. Yes, yeah. yes. Could you talk about? So uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, as, a, as a manager, financial type, I tend to put um, organizations into buckets. But as I recollect, coming to um, Boyce Thompson, there were four well-established programs. The environmental biology program, the nitrogen program, I'll mention tangentially, um, uh, Roy maintained a half lab and a, and a research program in nitrogen fixation. Uh, there was plant stress, um, I think I'm doing that right, uh, and virology, plant virology, and miscellaneous other <laughs> scientists who didn't have a home but were still with us. As R Ralph transitioned in, we went through some visioning exercises. A lot of Ralph's vision, but a lot of vision from world-renowned scientists uh, that said that the Institute was not on the cutting edge until it introduced the concept of molecular biology and reduction of science. 
that in and of itself is not a program, although we Ralph hired in Steve Howell, David Stern, Rob Last to create and populate the first molecular biology program. But molecular biology um, did not um, did not sit well with uh, the concept of environmental biology, which was cause and effect kind of science. And it was clear um, from the start that Ralph was moving uh, the institution away from molecular biology and away from some of the more applied projects and project leaders in other programs. So uh, stress related uh, as evidenced by external factors as opposed to it being analyzed by uh, molecular techniques. So clearly uh, Ralph was putting in place this transition. I, I'd love to mention the um, national symposium that Ralph chaired or, or hosted uh, key, uh, key scientists from um, uh, on the Cornell campus and uh, across the United States and invited them to the uh, Institute to talk about their vision of the future of plant scientists. And a uh, special note was the first speaker, uh, Carl Sagan. And you might wonder what a, <laughs> an astrophysicist, uh, writer of cosmos and world renowned uh, uh, proponent of, uh, of, of the uh, galaxy would be doing uh, articulating on plant biology, but Carl was brought in and talked about his view of the future and, and his need for um, comprehensive rethinking of plant biology. <laughs> it was interesting to note in the question and answer session, uh, Ralph took Carl Sagan to task for calling all of the amassed scientists botanists. But that brought the point home that we're no longer classical biolog botanists. We're chemists, we're molecular biologists, uh, we're, we're anything but simple botanists. <laughs> so that dialogue <laughs> was interesting. But it might also be interesting to note that I believe Charlie Arnson was one of the key speakers at a subsequent symposium along with Ted Huller to talk about government financing of plant sciences and also a couple of other individuals that eventually became board members. Uh, it might be important here to mention that around that time also a research oversight committee was established mm -hmm. and that was as I understood the board research advisory committee which which was uh, selected from the scientists not affiliated with BTI right just mm -hmm. to guide BTI towards this uh, more advanced uh, type of research. Yes my um my recollection of the timing is um, likely to be off on this, but um, I think Ralph, in, to support his view of the appropriateness and the currentness and the vitality of the science, uh, brought in um, scientists representative of each of the fields that we had at Boyce Thompson to serve, external scientists to serve on this research oversight committee. and. I believe the cycle was every three, two, three, maybe five years, where, these, where um, our scientists would present what, what their accomplishments were, what their research goals were, a uh, picture of their funding, and they would be reviewed by the Research Oversight Committee, uh, sometimes program, program by program, or sometimes broad brush with the entire science, our entire science community. And they would comment back to the president on strengths, weaknesses, recommendations. And that became a very valuable tool for Ralph uh, to, um, and, and subsequent presidents, although subsequent presidents were more or less, maybe less receptive to, to the input from the Research Oversight Committee. But, but that gave R Ralph the tools that he needed to begin this redirectioning of the science. And in addition to this research oversight committee, I think the nature of the board was changing uh, also during Ralph Hardy yeah. presidency. Uh, I understood that the age limit was uh, introduced to 70 years old and also the term was limited to five years now for board members. And in general, I think <laughs> a better knowledge of science was required for some okay. members of the board. I, you, I think you've hit, that, you've hit that right on. The, the age limit um, 
assisted Ralph in transitioning off uh, the legacy board, um, the uh, the old timers that uh, came from Yonkers. Um, it um, certainly, certainly an emphasis on the science because um, uh, unless it's fine to have a strong financial position, but our product is science. Our product is publications and cutting edge research. And um, the board has to balance both of those and understand the, the, the role of the president to accomplish a strong financial position, but also the best worldwide science, the best science in the world. I, that was never a question that um, presidents um, from, from Roy all the way on to David Stern were um, not desirous of having absolute world's finest science going on at BTI. Yeah, yeah. So I think with Ralph Hardy on the one hand, the president was trying to tighten the control over, you know, selection of the faculty and who should be uh, kept on, uh, on, on the faculty, but with a better advice coming, right, from the research mm -hmm. committee, from mm -hmm. the board, mm -hmm. or, or more sounded advice. And um, could we also uh, talk, John, about the relations that the president tried to improve, I think, with the people working at the Institute. I'm thinking about uh, selecting uh, uh, Bob Kohut to become the director of operation yeah. and also about the management advisory board committee. Sorry. Yeah. I can digress a little bit. Um, Ralph was an incredible negotiator. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I could talk a lot about his personal negotiations um, uh, and, and his role at BTI and his role with the staff, but he had a clear direction on where he wanted to take Boyce Thompson. And um, there was an inflection point and, and Ralph was clearly the transition from old school to new school. And it came in a part of his negotiation on his employment contract when he insisted that the title of managing director be changed to president. And, and the board, why do you want to do this? He said, nobody knows what a managing director is. It's arcane, it's confusing, but they know what a president is and they know what a president does. I want to be Boyce Thompson's president. And from that stems um, the concept of control, <laughs> the concept of a, um, a, a, um, a, a, a drivenness that um, um, that, that just moved the institute ahead. Um, I will I will say the institute is ex and I'm digressing here, but I'll come back. The institute is extremely fortunate to have Roy. Uh, I'm sorry, Ralph Hardy. Um, I think it was almost from the first day Ralph uh, came, uh, he had to fend off a uh, lawsuit from an external uh, developer uh, who was um, decided to sue Boyce Thompson Institute. Uh, for the cost of remediating a piece of property Boyce Thompson owned in Yonkers, in which they found some uh, greenhouse chemicals, properly disposed of, uh, everything done to the letter, but that lawsuit dragged on for at least four years. Ralph was dogged in his determination to defend the Institute. Uh, and eventually, although this was all secret, uh, there was a, um, a out-of-court settlement for a modest amount and, and Ralph was successful in that defense. He, um, he, in the midst of this, fended off a, an attempted unionization by our technical staff, who um, I'm certain had become convinced by the uh, <laughs> Cornell College of Industrial and Labor Relations that they were being, um, they were being mistreated. But when uh, we successfully defeated that unionization attempt, Roy, Ralph heard the message, and he said, um, we're gonna create a management advisory committee. We're gonna have representatives from the support staff, from the faculty, uh, and um, I think the PIs had their input through the um, uh, through another, uh, other conduits. But at least the management advisory committee was created, and Bob Kohut, who had transitioned or was in the process of transitioning from the environmental biology program, was asked to um, staff the first 
personnel department, now human relations, along with um, a very capable assistant, Ann Zintek, to create an HR department where, where the staff and the techs felt that they had some input into the decision-making process of management. And um, uh, I feel that was valuable and that worked. Bob was incredibly talented at um, letting people know that they were heard and communicating their concerns at the management, uh, at the management level. And uh, so, so, so that did take place. Um, and I hope that's answered that. Uh, yeah, especially question. at the time of profound reforms, this yeah. kind of building relation with the staff right. or at the various level was important, I guess. I, I might also mention in here that um, Ralph was extremely concerned about communicating science and um, uh, the fact that molecular biology was not a curse. Um, and he created um, something called the National Ag Biotech Council, uh, which brought together representatives of industry and representatives from university to talk about the cutting edge of science. And uh, also he had a government piece in there. And he, he sought external funding for that, and the National Ag Biotech Council was housed at Boyce Thompson Institute for Ralph's entire tenure. And um, Ralph actually staffed that um, with a former technician in his lab, a PhD, Alan Eaglesham. And we mentioned that the nit nitrogen fixation program, along with the environmental biology program, um, uh, were essentially um, eliminated or began to be uh, eliminated under Ralph's tenure. And one of his lab, that means his lab went as well, and, but one of his technicians, Alan Eaglesham, was retained to uh, head up the NABC. And there was no uh, institute money going into that other than our membership. And I think memberships were five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars and $15,000. And he was running a, a budget, several hundred thousand dollars, funding all of that work and coordinating that himself. I, I, I've got to tell you, Roy, uh, Ralph, <laughs> sorry about that. Ralph had an a, a amazing amount of energy. <sighs> Amidst all this, everything we've talked about, um, he lost his son in a tragic automobile accident. And, um, and it happened in uh, Lansing, New York in a very bad snowstorm, but he, he soldiered on um, and uh, very, very significant changes at the, uh, at the Institute. So I, I think a lot back about Roy, Ralph. Um, I, I'm trying to think where our, our endowment continued to grow. I kind of track our, our path through here. Um, uh, Ralph negotiated, <laughs> the consummate negotiator with the board, when we had hit a 6% withdrawal rate, the board said, Ralph, you can get one more percent, 5% next year. He said, no, 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 come on. Let's make it five and three quarters <laughs> next year and five and a half and five and a quarter. And they finally relented and said, okay, you got four more years to get us to 5%. Now, this was amid a growth rate that continued at about 10%, so they weren't giving up a lot. And finally, <laughs> in Ralph's last budget year, he said, oh, Damn the torpedoes! We'll set their draw rate at five percent and uh, build a budget around that. And uh, so uh, that uh, our endowment was approximately fifty million dollars at that point in time. So twenty-four million through uh, Roy Young's uh, tenure and Ralph Hardy's tenure to about fifty, sixty million dollars. It had, it had essentially doubled. I, I think the math says that, that a 10% rate of return, you'll double in about seven years. And we were drawing a little bit more than the 5% that we should have. So anyway, there you go. John, would you like to add anything about the relations between BTI and Cornell at the time? <laughs> so one, one of the <laughs> issues that I uh, have seen was improving the relations with entomology department, but maybe there are other stories have, that you might have. I'm less familiar with entomology, but I've got to, I got to share Ralph and Dean Call's dynamic. Uh, Dean David Call uh, replaced uh, uh, Dean Charles Palm uh, just at the beginning of uh, Roy, Ralph's, uh, <laughs> so sorry, Ralph's tenure. 
And uh, Dave Call was a rough hewn. Uh, he was he's Cornell through and through. He was from Batavia, New York, and he was a uh, I think he was a cabbage farmer in Batavia, New York. And and he and Ralph would sit across the table and uh, not yell at each other. But the, the cute story is is that. Um, at, at the time Ralph came aboard, the Institute was not fully occupied. We were not fully staffed. So there were some uh, available laboratories and a beautiful, beautiful greenhouse facility that was, I'd say, marginally being used. And Dean Call so desperately wanted <laughs> some of those greenhouses and uh, access to those unused labs. And Ralph did everything he could to uh, keep David out of the building because he knew that they would soon be filled. He actually went to the extent of putting paper over the window of the lab doors. So people walking up and down the hallways couldn't see into the laboratories. The, the one take home message that I remember from Ralph vis-a-vis -vis Cornell was John, he'd say to me, remember, we're BTI at Cornell University, not BTI of Cornell University. And um, until uh, transition later on, another 10, 15 years, we were BTI at Cornell University, and um, uh, that that was the dynamic. Um, I, I would say that each of the each of the project leaders, the principal investigators at at the institute, had an adjunct position at uh, in a department at the Cornell University. That's why the president of Cornell University. Um, well, I'm sorry. Uh, why Cornell had heavy input and a consultation as each of the scientists were hired because we had to make sure there was a fit. And um, the, the linkages to entomology and other programs in the end to chemistry, to biotech, all made a lot of sense. And all of our scientists, at least initially, sat in on committee meetings and, and staff meetings and eventually um, assumed some teaching load and actually eventually became began referring to themselves as professors, which always bugged the hell out of me. <laughs> okay, okay so this closer link started to be established during Ralph Haldi's tenure. Yes, yes, although I think, um, yes, Let, was, let's leave it at that. Yeah. Okay, John, we, uh, let's transition to Charles Alsen uh, years, which is 1996, 2000. If you could tell us a little bit about Charles Stahl as president yeah. and uh, what was his agenda at yeah. PTI. So if, Ralph, uh, if Roy, Hardy, uh, Roy Young was the, uh, the gentleman and Ralph was the negotiator, I'd have to say that Charlie Arnson was the promoter. And Charlie Arnson promoted his own science and he promoted the Institute's science and he promoted plant science worldwide and he promoted it at national meetings, at world meetings. He was championing the importance of plant science. And I, um, I, I just listened to the review articles that he read. I, I listened to his travels, and it was amazing to me. Char Charlie brought with him from Texas uh, three full laboratories, tractor trailers full of equipment and staff, and um, uh, Never, I think, never lost a beat. Uh, as I mentioned, Charlie was, um, and he wanted to be called Charlie. He, uh, Charlie um, uh, was one of those speakers at the visioning seminar that uh, Ro Ralph Hardy put on. And what struck me was one of the pictures in his presentation was in Southeast Asia, a mother carrying a child on a, on, a, on a baby bundle on her, on her chest and feeding the baby pieces of banana. And Charlie presented that slide in a seminar, and in that seminar, and he said, well, this looks like a mother feeding her child, but she could be vaccinating her child because the, the chemicals and the, um, the science that we're following now may enable us to put vaccines in bananas and stave off some of the tragic diseases that children get in third world, specifically diarrheal diseases, so on and so forth. So Charlie from day one was advocating in this application of science. Uh, never really came to fruition, but he was always advocating and always promoting. And Absolutely molecular biology. Uh, molecular biology, not as a program, 
but molecular biology as a set of tools. And that was the question. Why is your work important? What, what, what's, what, what is it about? What does it mean? Um, and and that, that cut pretty deep sometimes <laughs> as, as he made the, the balance of the uh, transitions out of the uh, old regime and into the new. So. so on the scientific side, by 1997, BTI really had effectively become an institute for molecular plant molecular biology. And we will probably discuss that with the molecular biologists and ti- yeah. scientists who work at the time and led the program. I wanted to ask you, John, more about your side of, the, of affairs, because in 1997, you became the vice president of finance and treasurer. So you started to play more and more significant role at BTI, as I understood. But there was also uh, other changes. Other changes were, uh, were taking place. Uh, Larry Russell became director of operations the quality of labs uh, were improved already during Ralph Hardy time, but continue to be improved during uh, Charles Anson years. And uh, as you said, the program uh, reductions continue until they were almost completely eliminated. Yeah. And this kind of collaboration between scientists was promoted that, that they work basically in teams on different, on different research uh, projects. Could you tell us about the management side of the institute, how things were yeah, changing. That's that's a great transition. Um, I was fortunate throughout my 28 years to work with some of the most incredible people. And one of those people was Larry Russell. <clears throat> Larry came from the Cornell side of facilities, the facility side of Cornell, and had coordinated projects on the campus. And to put it in a nutshell, Larry knew how to work with around and through <laughs> Cornell uh, physical plant. And Larry came aboard and with the assistance of uh, Larry Willard and Don Slocum, essentially redid every laboratory at Boyce Thompson Institute. Now it wasn't done in one fell swoop, but as each new scientist was brought aboard, they refurbished the laboratories. Now the laboratories weren't in bad shape. We were tearing out stuff that was better than uh, labs on most campuses, most places on the Cornell campus. The problem was is the laboratories weren't set up properly. Uh, They didn't have enough knee holes, places for techs to sit and do their work. All of the cabinets had steel fronts, not glass fronts. Uh, Couldn't see in, couldn't find your chemicals. There wasn't enough storage. The hoods were antiquated. And Larry and his team, as we were bringing in the new scientists, completely redid the Institute. At the same time, we were addressing air handling issues. And um, Larry worked with Cornell to get an assessment on on why our utility costs were so high. And it turned out we had several air turnovers an hour, taking all of the heat in the building and blowing it outside past inefficient air exchange wheels. So we designed and uh, redid our air handling system. And uh, consistent with that, the hoods in the laboratories were fixed to only work when the labs were occupied. Simple fix. Why blow the air out of the lab if there's nobody in there and there are no chemicals in there? Uh, The chemicals all went into uh, uh, individually vented chambers. So all of that very, very important work, not only to make the place um, more functional for the new scientists, but more energy efficient was was Larry Larry Russell. I can't thank him more than I, I, I can. Also, the, the day I left the Institute, 28 years later, it looked no worse and even some places better for the wear and tear in the hallways, in the atrium area, and even to some extent outside. And, and um, that's all to Larry's credit. Um, Found him the funding, and he got it done. Also, a little bit later on, uh, Larry, uh, the Larrys, Larry Russell and Larry Willard and Don Slocum coordinated the complete rebuilding of the plant culture wing, better known as the greenhouse area and the environmental chambers. And um, that, I think to this day, it remains a state-of-the-art uh, plant culture area at Boyce Thompson. And so those were the changes, and th- these... These are all done um, 
Well, one thing I have to, I have, many things, but I have to credit Charlie Arnson with, was a deal he made with the board. And the deal was is that as our endowment was growing, it was growing very well. And Charlie said to the board, look, to, to restaff and to bring in these new scientists, I'm going to need some money. Let's put aside, I believe the number was $10 million. <laughs> Let's put aside one single draw, $10 million to fund this work. I won't come back and ask you for any more money to renovate laboratories. I won't ask you for any more money for startup packages, whatever. But I need you to make this investment in the redirectioning of the Institute. The board funded it. And over probably the next five to seven years, we built our offer packages to the scientists. Their, their, um, their salaries had to be incorporated in our operating budget. But a certain amount of support time for their research as they transitioned, a new laboratory. Um, the laboratory cost didn't come out of their startup package, but it had to come out of that $10 million, and so on and so forth. So Charlie, in one fell swoop, uh, gave himself a nest egg with which to make offers, very generous offers, I think, to uh, new scientists, and, and the process began. And I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I, I don't remember a lot of the names of the folks that transitioned in during that time period, but um, uh, there, 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 were, there have to have been a half a dozen scientists that came in during that time period, and that pro progressed on and continued on through the classic era as well. So. Mm -hmm. So we are entering year 2000 with Dan Klessing, uh, Klessig as next president. What was happening <laughs> then in the last 10 years of your work at BTI? Well, that's interesting. Um, as Dan transitioned in, we were just um, contemplating and eventually Dan agreed to uh, recomputerization, moving us to a new software package and new computers. But all that we kept in the background. Um, Dan... If Charlie was the promoter, Dan, Dan, Dan was the intense, intelligent, caring guy that could never say no uh, and was a consummate perfectionist. Um, there was never a piece of work that I put on Dan's desk that couldn't be a little bit better. There was never a paper that he wanted to publish that couldn't have a little bit more research. There was never... A scientist that was quite up to par, but in saying all of that, Dan Dan was was kind. He ran his own laboratory, and I think he was up to two labs when he was working as president. So Dan attempted to run a complete research project program with all that intensity and be BTI president at the same time. And I must say, he succeeded for about four years, but it almost, and, and it almost killed him. <laughs> he had some health related issues, which I think he'll probably talk to you about later. But all during that period, he was intense. He was a quick study on the finances. He was adamant about scientists uh, applying for uh, and uh, uh, re outside funding and uh, adamant about not drawing more than their fair share or a reasonable share out of the endowment. And um, Don, Dan probably moved the intellectual property work ahead um, as aggressively, if not more, than, um, than Ralph when he initiated it. And I believe it was under Dan's uh, tutelage that I was able to give up that responsibility, bring Paul Debbie in, and and Paul did just a remarkable job. It's another example of giving a talented per person responsibility, authority, and funds to uh, do a job and have it done uh, have it done well. Uh, Dan was especially um, uh, productive, I believe, in um, developing intellectual property that could be patented and maybe possibly marketed. I'm away from that now, so I, so I don't know. Then Klessing presidency was relatively short. It was just 2000, 2004. And you were taking part also in the transition from this presidency to the next one as vice president of BTI together with uh, David Stern. Uh, could you tell us a few words about the presidency of David Stern 
uh, and I will just have a few minutes to discuss your own personal achie uh, professional achievements, uh, uh, you know, during your time at at BDI. So, so it was a, it was a was a, a time of change. Um, Dan Dan had to step down for health reasons, and a uh, search was immediately begun. David uh, was chairing the search, David Stern. Um, but it came obvious to the board that they had a headless uh, horseman here and they needed uh, they needed a president. So my, my claim to fame that uh, I was co-president with Dave uh, for probably a period of six months uh, during that transition from Dan to the new president. Um, uh, they had any number of uh, presidential candidates come in and talk. But in the end, um, David uh, was identified as the, the individual that uh, was best suited to be our president. And I think it was a good choice. Um, we didn't see any good fits. And uh, so David became our president. Um, I'm not sure what at that point in time uh, my title had gravitated to, but I used to tell people it's everything that isn't science. And and only a part of human resources. <laughs> so so that was a an exciting ta transaction. The, the transaction to David was uh, one was amazing. Um, David is a quick study. Um, I I could show him the budget on one page and he could see everything. He could say, well, where did this number come from? I tell him where that number came from. I say, I think that's a little much. I've got I've got some other plans here. Cut cut this back. Cut that back and. We'd do it over a beer at the Boyce Thompson Southwestern <laughs> Arboretum, but he had an incredible grasp on the finances. He also had a vision. Um, David uh, um, was bringing um, uh, BTI and the university closer and closer together. And um, I think he's almost the uh, flip of a Ralph Hardy. Um, uh, I, I believe even during this era, era, the scientists began referring to themselves as professors, which is fine. It's annoying, but it's fine. <laughs> they were BTI principal investigators and project leaders, and that's good. But they're also adjunct faculty. I don't think there were anybody that was in a, in a faculty track. I don't think that was possible at Cornell. But he was bringing the entities closer together. Um, uh, as in Ralph's era and in Charlie Arnton's era, they were stressing collaborations, making these large grant applications uh, broader, more expansive, more palatable, I think, to the funding agencies. That was a key trend that we didn't talk about, is in the, in the Hardy era and um, uh, early, um, early Arntzen era, we were, each of the scientists was getting their own individual funding. It's very unusual to have a collaborative grant. But as we transitioned from Arntzen and, and into David, uh, into Dan, and into David, there's big mega projects. Um, heck, we had even gotten funding from DARPA, which is the Federal Defense Agency Research Entity, which, uh, which brought together engineering, Boyce Thompson and Gary Blissard, and um, uh, probably chemistry and entomology to, uh, to work on, a, on, on an amazing project that's Probably top secret, and I'm not going to talk to you. <laughs> but that's the kind, and this was a multi-million dollar, three or four year project. And just like DARPA, it came and it went. But um, uh, that that was a, that was a big change. Scientists were urged to collaborate both within the institute and between Cornell and and their peers on the campus. And, John, and apart from that, could you talk about the changes on the management and services side? Yeah. You told me there was a slight transition also during David's stand from this older generation to newer right. generation right. and also right. integrating Cornell services uh, into, into uh, So I, I think David and I had maybe four years together and um, I believe during that period, and uh, it's still a little vague to me, but I think there was a revisioning going on, a revisioning going on, that um, why do we need to maintain our uh, internal computing services, telephone services, mechanical services, da 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 da, da when those resources could be put to better use. To, um, uh, to collaborative spaces. I'm thinking about the plant tissue culture wing so ably developed and run by Joyce Van Eck and, and um, to shared, uh, shared uses of, uh, of greenhouse space and other laboratories. And, 
um, uh, those kinds of things. So I, I would say that we're going through a revisioning, as I understand now, um, uh, pretty much has been a, um, a movement of the endowment to Cornell, possibly back. So the management moved to Cornell University. Um, uh, and, and I believe many of the practices that uh, take place on the campus now have been incorporated into the operation at Boyce Thompson. I, uh, I used to have a favorite saying, and I'll, I'll, I'll let this be taped. Our motto should not be, we're no worse than Cornell. <laughs> my, my, my standard always was, let's get there, but let's, let's do it a little bit better. Let's, let's have people want to stay here at Boyce Thompson. So, so, so a transition, it was a time. I was made a wonderful, wonderful offer and, uh, for um, an early retirement, but a timely retirement. And um, uh, I remained retired for about two days and went off to Wells College to be their uh, comptroller. So. <laughs> John, so, so just to finish our interview, looking back at the 20 year, 28 years of, of your affiliation uh, with PTI, could you talk about uh, what you feel were your main achievements during that time and also how your role at BTI was evolving? You know, what were the changes in your sector of work, financial work? So I have to say it was absolutely an incredible experience. Um, uh, I think to my credit is I, I, I stayed out of people's way and I lost no presidents to jail time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we, we went from a, um, a ledger-based accounting system to a full-blown management information system. Um, and I didn't do that. Uh, I had um, some of the most incredible staff you could ever want. Anyway, uh, a, mo a system and a, a way of operating where we stayed out of people's way. That means that um, they weren't bothered with finances. They got monthly project cost reports. They knew what their encumbrances were. They knew on each of their projects what their standing was. I would touch base with the scientists once a year in our budgeting process to see how much they were going to spend, or encourage them to spend, because they weren't going to have that backfill from the Institute. I think I developed um, an appreciation for the plant scientists, sciences that I didn't have when I left Cornell University, but really, um, personally, an appreciation for the commitment of, of uh, the principal investigators, the project leaders, and those that support them, that's a good, good, good place. And um, um, uh, only think back with positive, positive thoughts. Um, I have staff that I still am close, close friends with. Uh, Joanne and Doug Carruthers, Shirley Geddes, uh, Lisa Christian, Nancy Ray, all those folks that supported me. I did, didn't really do the work. I set the standards, set the goals, and was there to make sure that uh, we were servicing the staff. I, I again, will say that Larry uh, Russell, Larry Willard, Don Slocum made that building a beautiful, beautiful place to work. Support people like Joan Curtis and Elaine Van Etten, Greta Calavito, and I'm not even mentioning the folks on the science side uh, that are, still see it, BJ's and Walmart, <laughs> um, and, and the scientists, uh, John Lawrence, Bob Kohut, all the folks in the... Uh, environmental biology program was so hard to lose them as, as we transition out. Anyway. Okay, John, I think we will stop here. Thank you so much Thank for you. your story. Thank you for this opportunity.